Hello, everybody. Before we jump into the presentation, there's going to be a few questions that are going to appear up on your screen. Please take a minute to answer these, and we will begin shortly. Okay, thank you everybody for doing that. Um, my name is Sue Brzee I handle the marketing here at 2W Tech, and I'll be your moderator today. Today's presentation is on cybersecurity compliance. If at any time during the presentation you have questions, please send them through the question box that should appear on your screen. There'll be an interactive Q&A at the end, and we'll try to get to all your questions then. For those of you who might not be familiar with 2W Tech, we're a full-service Microsoft and Epicor certified partner as well as a tier one cloud service provider. We specialize in manufacturing solutions, but have clients from various other industries as well. For more information on our products and services, you can visit us at qwtech.com. The presenters for today's webinar are Tom Guerin, who's a senior systems engineer, and Mark Jamison, who's our CEO and president at 2W Tech. I will now turn it over to Mark to get the presentation started. Hey, thanks, Sue. To get everybody just kind of where we are on this, we've been um, uh, approached by several of our clients lately on, uh, on the compliance measures of their IT infrastructure. And what we're starting to see is we're starting to see not only is there a uh, alphabet soup of regulations and uh, 
uh, and other types of uh, compliances being forced upon our clients, but uh, their customers are forcing them down this. So what we're seeing is these compliances are being forced down the supply chain from the very large, all the way from the very large uh, um, uh, companies to the uh, uh, to the very small companies. And in fact, it's uh, there are uh, about 175 regulatory bodies worldwide, and there's an average of 201 new regulations issued every day on IT security throughout all these various regulations. And most U.S. companies fall within these regulations. So the chances are that you are going to fall under one of these regulations, if not multiple parts of these regulations. And chances are that you are going to be approached to be audited. Uh, chances are that your customers are going to uh, uh, ask you to fill out uh, uh, very large, very complicated spreadsheets on how you may comply with the uh, uh, regulatory Tory agencies that are forcing them to comply, and I think it is uh, uh, it's going to become more and more of a question and an issue that we're going to have to address. And so we're going to spend the next half hour here, uh, just kind of walking you through that uh, uh, kind of through that process and what it is. So most of these compliances uh, they they kind of center they they, they center around just a few uh, of the basic. Um, uh, pieces. One is uh, just the protection of information, right? The protection of personal information, the potential, uh, the protection of financial information, uh, technical information, not just uh, you or your people, but also other uh, individuals and other technologies and other technical information, right? It's the control of your information piece. So that is anywhere from uh, who has access to what, uh, how do we protect our data? Uh, how do we protect uh, who goes into what systems? Um, the policies that you have in place, or in many cases don't have in place, uh, the written policies uh, to control uh, uh, employee behaviors. Don't click on this link. This is how we protect our data. Um, this is how we uh, uh, this is how we we handle this type of information. Uh, and then, of course, the physical security. So what we find is is that the access to your servers access to your buildings, uh, access to your workstations, that type of thing. And so what we find is, is that all of, these, uh, uh, all of these regulatory bodies, they all kind of encompass this in a nutshell. Uh, the, the big ones that we see uh, out there that our clients are coming to us, there's many, many more, obviously, uh, but uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the NIST, uh, those are four suppliers of uh, federal agencies. Um, PCI is required for anybody handling uh, any credit card information. So if you're taking credit card information, it might be as simple as someone gives you a credit card, you write it down on a piece of paper, what's your policy to uh, dispose or to secure that piece of paper that that credit card is, uh, uh, is written on. Uh, if you're a defense contractor or you supply to a defense co contractor, chances are you will fall under the ITOR, ITAR uh, regulatory um, uh, compliances. Uh, GDPR is a new regulation that is being rolled out in the EU. It uh, centers around the identifiable personal data of EU and UK citizens. Um, this is uh, uh, this is going to be a uh, a very widespread. You're going to hear a lot about it, especially as we get closer to May. But if you do business in the EU or you do business with people uh, in the EU, uh, if you have a salesman who tracks the birthdays of a customer in the EU, uh, that all applies to um, uh, GDPR. HIPAA is uh, the uh, uh, personally identifiable uh, health patient information. Uh, primarily, as you probably know, this applies to your doctor and the hospitals and stuff, but it also may apply to your HR director uh, if they have the doctor that a particular uh, employee uh, goes to, uh, that would fall under the uh, HIPAA, HIPAA compliances. And then the Sarbanes-Oxley Acts or SOX compliancy, that pr primarily applies to publicly held companies and subsidiaries. Uh, you may also see some stuff, uh, general IP control. Uh, it's also referred to as that, uh, but basically that's all around uh, creating uh, audit trails to changes in your network. 
making sure there aren't overlaps in duties so not one person can handle multiple things. Uh, this becomes a real challenge, especially in a smaller organization if you're, uh, uh, if you're subject to uh, SOX compliancy. So the penalties for this stuff, it can be very, very punitive. Um, ITAR can be as high as uh, $500,000. You can go to jail for 10 years if you're uh, uh, found uh, out of regulation for this. Uh, PCI is anywhere from five to $100,000 per month. Um, the GDPR piece is, it's a company killer, quite frankly. Um, if you're fined out of compliance in GDPR, it could cost you 4% of your global annual revenue or uh, $24 million, whichever is higher. So the chances are if you're not gonna go to jail for 10 years uh, if you're found out of compliance uh, in, of ITAR. But the fact of the matter is, is there are some real penalties that occur uh, when you're not in compliance. Uh, one of them is the opportunity to work with larger customers. Most of our clients uh, who supply to uh, uh, larger organizations, tier one type uh, uh, organizations, um, have to comply in some form or fashion to whatever regulatory system that they put them under. Uh, and if you can't do it or you don't have it readily available, uh, you may miss that big order. Uh, Productivity losses due to the computer, the networking issues, uh, trying to get into um, things, uh, 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 just just inefficient networks. Uh, that's a that's a real penalty where you're just messing with your network all the time, and then of course just the lack of confidence of uh, potential customers, investors, board members. They come in, your network's a mess, your information services are a mess, your computer room isn't secure. Um, uh, it, it's hard to present a, a, a good, uh, solid uh, face to those people uh, when that part of your business isn't buttoned down, especially because it's becoming more and more visible. Uh, but besides all that stuff, the fact is, is that um, it's just a good idea. Uh, the um, uh, uh, by doing these things that are laid out in the uh, in the regulatory compliance uh, checks. Um, will improve you the security of your network. You improve the security of your network, that means you're going to have less intrusions, you're gonna have less hacking, um, you're gonna have less viruses, um, uh, you're going to uh, uh, mess with your network less, it's going to become more reliable, which means uh, you won't have uh, uh, the repair costs and the legal fees and, and those things that might occur uh, from that. Um, You'll have more control over your employees. You'll be able to minimize uh, someone accessing the wrong thing or deleting the wrong file. Um, uh, and you just create that trust bond, right? Where customers, uh, if, you, if, if, you have your, if you have your act together from an IT compliance, it shows that you have your act, it, it infers that you have your act together for, the enti for your entire organization. And as we're seeing more and more pressure and attention put to these types of things, um, uh, you, just, you, just, you just create that trust bond uh, between your, uh, uh, your customers and your suppliers. So, so what is this stuff, right? And so as we go through and we do common, uh, or we do deficiencies, uh, uh, deficiency gaps uh, with some of our clients, there's some commonalities that we find that are kind of low-hanging fruit. And I'm going to have Tom kind of walk you through those now. Tom? All right. Thanks, Mark. Uh, you know, so uh, like Sue said, my name's Tom Guerin. I'm one of the senior engineers here at 2W. And uh, I just want to spend a few minutes not so much trying to get us into the details of all of the different, you know, regulatory agencies and compliance measures and things like that that are out there. Um, you know, with hundreds of regulatory agencies, it, it could take me days just to read off the list of things that you might be subject to. Um, but more to talk about, like Mark said, the com some of the commonalities, some of the common areas, to get people thinking about some, maybe some places you hadn't thought about. Some of these will look like common sense, and some of them you might be like, oh, I, that never even showed up for me. So um, we kind of group these, don't get hung up on the groups that we group these into, but uh, just as discussion areas. So one of the first areas I want to talk about is just admin rights. 
Uh, one of the very first things that we do when we come in and we're looking to do uh, an evaluation of your uh, either your compliance posture or just, or just of network security in general is we look at who are the who are the admins who's got you know kind of full rights to your servers and systems and especially in smaller companies or in companies that have grown and just kind of evolved over the years one of the things we find is the everyone's an admin syndrome um, it's much easier to grant full admin rights to everyone than to you know pause take the time set up groups delegate rights who needs access to what uh, you know we could I mean I could spend forever going into each of these but I, for that one alone you, know, you can see that once you've started down that road it becomes very difficult to back out of it and um, you know it's actually one of the more painful ones to get back out of people are, get used to having rights to things people software is installed it's been installed as an administrator computers have been set up and everybody's got administrator rights and things like that so to back out of that uh, and get yourself in a more stable and secure environment um, can be fairly time consuming so it's one of the ones we, first ones we check for so we can you know, really let people know um, security rights based on importance so again, it tends to fall into you know small privately held companies. I'm the owner, so I should have access to everything. Uh, I manage that department, so I need to have access to everything. Or I'm the man a manager, and I should have access to everybody else's stuff. Uh, those types of things. Um, it's not so much that you, you know we want to prevent you from it, as we want to prevent problems. So you know if you're the owner of a company, do you really need to have access to, I don't know, uh, engineering drawings or something like that that you never actually use? Um, or does having your account have access to those just prevent another vector for an infection or some kind of um, nefarious activity that you're unaware of? And there's also you know, such a thing as being, how do I want to say it, um, have enough rights just to be dangerous. So maybe you don't need to have those rights, but you do. Uh, shared use accounts. This is a very, very, very common one. Um, you know, we'll come in and we'll find there's three different people logged in as shipping, or the front office is all logged in as admin and administrative, or uh, reception, something like that. Uh, the other types of shared use accounts we'll often see are shop accounts, things like that. Um, getting those separated out into uh, Accounts that are actually identifiable to a user is really important. So if you've got, uh, you know, you can look at that from a lot of different directions. For instance, if you have three different people all using an account named Shipping, then if there is some um, bad behavior on the account of a ship, on, on the uh, shipping account, you know, how do you identify who that was? And you've made your job a lot more difficult. Also, if you have some kind of turnover, uh, you know, an employee leaves, you're going to now need to go re-educate everyone on passwords and things like that, or even worse, leave the password the same, and now you've got a uh, an account at, that's sitting out there that somebody who doesn't work for you anymore has access to. Um, also, shared use accounts comes up a lot in the world of uh, administrative accounts. So you might have, you know, several people, vendors, um, your own IT staff, or others who log in as administrator or some other you know admin type account um, same thing but probably even worse so you've got an account that's got really full access to something and you don't have a way of identifying who's actually using that account and often don't have an easy way then to um, do things like update passwords and so on if somebody you know if you no longer use that vendor or if you again if you have turnover <laughs> Um, and then the last piece of that one on that admin list there uh, would be using admin accounts for daily use. And this is one that's very, very, very common. Uh, and it's kind of how things have evolved over the years as we've used computers. And that's, you know, so if I log into my account, uh, my Tom G account, and it has admin rights, you know, throughout the system, for instance, do I really need to have it? and be logged in using an account that has admin rights for my day-to-day -day business. For some people, yes. If your job is IT support and that's what you're doing all day, then maybe you do. For most people, probably no. 
And by doing that, you've opened up and exposed yourself. So if I'm out surfing the internet and I'm logged in using an admin account and you know I somehow managed to get infected or run something that I shouldn't have or what have you, just as an example, I've now granted that bad process, you know, the ability to act as me as an admin. Uh, so, you know, one of the things that we look for is to have people actually logging in using accounts that have the rights that they need to do their jobs, as opposed to having just full access all the time. So, beyond then, you know, users and access, our users and admin rights, we want to look at, um, you know, areas, what do you have access to? So, open file shares is a big one. Again, one of the things that we scan for very early when we come in and do a review is open file shares. So, you know, does everyone have access to the accounting files? Does everyone have access to the accounting software? Uh, do you have, have you exposed, I don't know, payroll data to the shop users? Are things just hidden because they're hidden or are they hidden by uh, using access controls? So we want to make sure that the access controls are set properly on file shares. Uh, generic passwords, that kind of goes to the admin account type thing. But here we're talking about things like um, infrastructure. So you might have all of your switches, routers, and so on, all using the same password, for instance. Or all of your services, service accounts, for the, those of you who are setting up those kinds of things, you might be using the same pa password for all of those. Uh, again, it makes maintaining those difficult if there's a, a reason or a need to change a password now you've got to change them all, um, as opposed to having you know, device-specific or purpose-specific um, passwords and accounts. Remote access software. Um, we've gotten, you know, we, our company and many companies, you know, many of us work from the road, we work from home, we work from, you know, all over the place now. And there's a lot of different ways of, uh, that you remote, remotely ac access your systems. So, you know, looking and seeing what are those? Was there a company decision made to provide the remote access or did somebody install, you know, go to my PC or log me in or any of a thousand different remote access pieces on their personal PC or on their desktop PC? Um, are you as a company monitoring it? Are you managing it or is it just kind of happening to you? Um, many of those packages are not what we would call, you know, enterprise grade security. So, you know, how are you logging that? How are you managing it? Um, related to that would then would be uh, Wi-Fi. You know, pretty much every company you walk into now, you've got Wi-Fi access of some kind. Is that Wi-Fi, you know, does everyone in the company know the password? Is that Wi-Fi getting me directly into the company LAN as if I were plugged in? Or is it set up for guest access? Or even worse, did the guests have access to the company LAN? Uh, you know, how is that set up? How is it managed? How are the passwords rotated if they are? Um, those kinds of things, you're just really looking at Wi-Fi as a, you know, wide open portal where somebody could be sitting in a parking lot across the street. You know, you may not even physically see the person who's accessing your network. Um, again, you know, these are kind of, they're not really in any order for you, but I want to kind of jump over to this, back to this idea of security. So, um, backups. You know, one of the things that we'll see is you know you might have all of your file shares highly secured and the files themselves highly secured and the systems highly secured which we'll talk about in a second uh, but then your backups are sitting on a usb drive that you know sits on somebody's desk or your backups if you're you know using tape i know most of you aren't anymore but you know your backups are sitting on tape somewhere or maybe they're being done off-site at your it vendor and you don't even know what the security is of those backups. Um, how are those backups secured? How are they secured physically as well as logically? So if somebody were to get a hold of that USB drive, would they then have access to everything that was backed up on it? Um, you know, that's actually a really common one. Uh, then we can get into physical security. So, you know, again, from the world of access. So is your server room locked? You know, it's a pretty simple one, right? Uh, your clients, laptops, you know, things like that. Again, the backup devices. Um, how are you securing those things? Um, many, many environments that we walk into, you know, you'll see that the servers are 
you know, somebody, it's a direct line from the front door. Um, maybe it would happen during the business day that somebody would just literally physically take the machine, or maybe, you know, it would happen after hours, but it's such a short walk that it's possible. Um, so physically securing it, as well as um, physically protecting it, you know, so you might want to think about fire systems, things like that. Uh, you know, how are how is that equipment protected just to uh, more from a disaster type scenario rather than from a data loss? Excuse me. <coughs> All right, sorry about that. Um, the next kind of category that we'd want to lump things into is control. So, you know, this is more managing how uh, your users behave and how you behave. So security warnings, you know, Windows now for um, many years has had uh, something called user account control or user access control uh, variably in, uh, built into it, and it's enabled by default. And that's that thing that pops up those silly warnings that say, you know, are you sure you want to do this? And this program is trying to make changes to your computer. You want to allow it, those types of things. We see those disabled all the time. Uh, they are annoying. Uh, they've gotten better with Windows 10, but they're still annoying when they pop up sometimes. The thing is, with those enabled, bad software can't do things without you telling it it's okay. With those disabled, bad software can do whatever it wants and you don't even know it's happening. Uh, group policies. So within a Windows network, you've got, and most other environments as well, you've got the ability to set group policies where you can determine uh, account behavior. Um, this would be places where you would do things like set up um, password expiration. You need to change your passwords every certain number of days. There's new guidance on that, but um, password complexity might be the next thing to think about from a group policy standpoint. Are you allowing complex passwords or are you allowing, you know, Three digit, you know, three digit numbers, um, or even worse, no password. Um, so you know, things like that, or you know, is there a lockout limit? Is a big one. Um, you know, so if you've got an account, if you kind of put yourself in the seat of a hacker for a moment, and you know that everybody has got an account named shipping, and that account doesn't have any kind of protection against uh, to enable lockouts turned on on it, you can sit there and try passwords all day long until you find it. Now, if you've got lockout disabled or enabled, so after you know three invalid passwords, the account gets locked for 30 minutes, that's really gonna slow down somebody's process of brute forcing that password. There's certainly other ways to crack passwords, but brute force is still the most common, and um, that simple policy enabled you know, can make a big difference, but we see it turned off all the time. Uh, poorly configured software, again, from a control standpoint. So, you know, uh, Epicor, of course, we're an Epicor partner. That's one of the one of the areas where we'll see it is that, you know, by default, they just give everybody access to everything within Epicor. Or they just use the top-level menu security to prevent access to something as opposed to controlling it down at the object level. Uh, so there's a, you know, the ability to, um, you could circumvent that, for instance. The other place where we'll see that is when it was actually installed. Uh, it's often easier, again, to just turn on everyone full control and walk away. Well, that doesn't leave you with a secure environment. That leaves you with an environment where, um, I don't know, your payroll person prints a payroll report or prints checks. You may or may not know that Epicor stores that print file in a, uh, in a text file that's readable by anyone that has access to the folder. It stores that all those payroll checks in a text file that's sitting there. And if that folder has everyone full access, then anybody in the company could come along and look at that file, which is probably not what your intention was. But it's a very common misconfiguration. Um, in the world of control, then looking at, you know, how do you manage changes? So what's your process? Um, you know, what's your process for managing security changes? Do you have a request and review and document cycle when things are changed? Or is it kind of uh, somebody walks in and says, hey, I need blah, 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 and somebody grants it to them? Um, you know, having a process to manage that, whether it's through a ticketing system like we use, or whether it's through some kind of a, you know, other structure, uh, having a, the ability to manage that is 
is really important, especially you know when you think about over time. You know why why did user Joe have access to this? Why was it granted? When was it granted? Um, that can really help you out. You know years after the fact, figuring out um, whether or not you can change something. Um, related to that somewhat would be unrestricted internet. Uh, we see this pretty you know, way more often than you would think. Um, you know, just wide open internet for everyone or for, you know, large groups of users larger than needed. Uh, you know, that, that presents a legal problem, if nothing else. You know, uh, do you want to open yourself up to the harassment type charges and claims and things like that, that having unrestricted internet has? Or do you want to be able to have a policy in place that you can point to in the, you know, in that circumstance? It says, no, we have a policy, uh, you know, that we enforce. Um, also, you know, that goes to things like social media, it goes to, you know, all of those others, even just from a performance standpoint, you know, maybe you want to manage the access to those things. Maybe you don't want to prevent them, but maybe you want to, you know, limit it to hour, certain hours of the day, or maybe you want to limit the amount of bandwidth that can be used for YouTube videos or, you know, something like that. So those are areas maybe outside of compliance a little bit in that case, but certainly something that you'd want to be looking at as you're looking at the overall picture. Um, next couple items, you know, looking at auditing, you know, what's happening, who's doing it. Again, this really goes back to making, you know, having the infrastructure in place to do that. So having the ability to audit things, having the, having users assigned to specific accounts. So, uh, you know, I don't know Mark's password. So if, and nobody else does. So if an account is logged in, someone is logged in as Mark doing something, it's either Mark or Mark's account's been compromised. And we can look at the audit logs and see what's Mark been up to. Um, and that would play then also into some kind of automated monitoring. Uh, in many cases, and also in compliance areas, you'll look and see the ability to flag uh, unusual behavior. So um, the NIST standards as well as ITAR both have some, uh, some built-in monitoring requirements. Um, you know, if Sue's account does not normally access certain areas of the network and it's suddenly copying large chunks of data out of engineering, for instance, uh, that might be something that you'd be interested in. And you want to actually be proactively warned about that. Uh, and then also physical security. Now we're looking at physical security uh, to your environment, so as opposed to the equipment. So, you know, do you use cameras? Should you? Um, should people be logging in and out? Um, if you're, you know, subject to ITAR and several of the other controls, you know, are they U.S. citizens or not? Should they have access to your engineering spaces or not? Should, or their, your production spaces or not? Are they wearing name badges? Are your staff trained on how to respond to those people? And the uh, last piece of that would be policies, uh, which we can get into here as well. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, that's fine. So uh, written policies. You know, what do your, and we had a poll question at the beginning there, uh, you know, what do your written policies look like? And are your employees trained on them? You know, do you make sure to go back over those with people, you know, on a regular basis? Uh, some of the regulations have particular intervals that you need to go over them with. Others, it's really up to you, but, you know, you want to have something in place and be able to say, yes, we're doing that. And, you know, make sure that your employees are really trained. How do we respond to a threat? Or how do you respond to a concern? So, you know, I clicked on this thing, I realized I shouldn't have, who do I tell? Or do I hide it? Um, I heard from a customer that they got access to blah, blah, blah. What do I do about that? Those types of things, how do you report things? Um, along with those policies, and then this really starts to get into this category of maintenance, is maintaining your environment. So, you know, we, our companies have turnover. You know, when an employee leaves, what do you do with those old accounts, with those old email boxes, with those old documents? What's your procedure for those? And really having a clear procedure that everyone knows and everyone's you know, able to follow. Um, and then disabling access. As simple as that sounds, it's actually surprisingly not done very often. Um, mobile devices. Everyone's got a mobile device now. You've got tablets, you've got phones, you've got laptops, all of them with the ability to pull different pieces out of your network. Um, you know, I just saw the other day on TV, there was a 
you know, one of the media that got themselves into some trouble had supposedly left their phone somewhere and then someone sent a, an email or a tweet from their phone. I, I find that impossible. You know, I, I can't imagine an environment where I would have a device that's got access to um, something critical that doesn't have a password or a pin at the very least, right? Um, so, you know, having a pin on your phone. You know, if your customers are sending you engineering data or financial data or you're sending them, those things probably are on your phone if it's up to your email. Again, having some kind of protection for that as well as the ability to remotely wipe that data. So with Office 365, with some of the exchange solutions and some other options that are out there, you know, being able to, you know, have someone say, hey, I you know, lost my phone last night. I don't know where it is. And then maybe we can remotely locate it or we can remotely wipe the data off of it. You know, those are um, really important functions that you want to make sure are set up in advance of when you need them. Um, then lack of awareness, you know, we talked a little bit about uh, employee training again, end, your train, end user training. Uh, having a, somebody at your company that is accountable for compliance. And, you know, that sometimes often falls in the financial area, but it doesn't have to. Um, you know, but having somebody who's really taken on that role, and that's something that we at UW from the uh, information technologies direction can certainly work with you on, but it's also something that's you know, gonna be very unique to your company, your environment. We're really having that be clear and having everyone know who's, you know, who's our compliance person. Who can I go to with questions? Who can I go to with concerns? Uh, last couple items on control, uh, user installed software. You know, you don't want to get in the way of your users doing what they need to do, but also having the ability to manage that. Keep yourself out of trouble with licensing issues. Keep yourself out of trouble with, um, you know, third-party software that's not behaving as you would want or as it should. We talked about remote software that could also be, you know, CAD software. It could be, you know, a lot of different things that um, might be useful and usable and things that you, your employees want to use, but doing it in an unmanaged way can get you in trouble down the road. Uh, and then lastly, and this is a huge one, um, I think every company that we've ever walked into, we have found some examples of unsupported or unupdated uh, operating systems, so software, uh, hardware, and um, firmware, you know, drivers, BIOS, things like that. Um, you know, I, there's been in the news lately some security concerns with processors. And those that affects processors made over the last 25 years. If you have, if you're running hardware that's not um, supported any longer, or if you're running operating systems that aren't supported any longer, you may not get updates to those. There just may not ever be updates to those, and those devices will forever be vulnerable to these attacks. If you're running something that is currently, you know, being supported by the both the hardware manufacturer as well as the software that's on it. Um, making sure that you actually get those patches applied. So every computer on, just to take, you know, the example of just the, that recently, the recent, excuse me, recent vulnerability, every computer on your network requires an operating system update um, and hardware updates in order to comply with that, or in order to mitigate the concern from those. So um, those would be things that would come up in an audit. And Mark, did we break anything else out or is that, no, that's uh, there, no, right? you, no, that's it. Yeah, thanks, Tom. That was a uh, nice job. So now that everybody's head has exploded, um, yeah, right. That's a long list. <laughs> <laughs> what do you What do you do about it? Right. So uh, I guess I guess there's a couple of takeaways here. If if you're you know, how do you begin to eat this elephant and uh, to get your arms around it? And um, I, when we walk into organizations, one of the things we find is they just a lot of the compliance part of it can be satisfied by just maintaining uh, a, a, an information uh, policy, right? Your IT policy, your behavioral policy. Um, just having that in writing, having that part of your uh, employee handbook uh, can take care of uh, a lot of the uh, compliance use. What, what, is the, what, what do you do when this happens sort of thing? So um, if you don't have one, you need one. And if you got one, you need to update it. 
Uh, so if your IT policy is primarily concerned about the transmission of faxes, uh, you probably need to uh, you probably need to open that up and take a look at it. Um, build, upgrade, and maintain a secure network. Right now, it seems really really simple. But the, the fact of the matter is, is we walk into a lot of places that are using uh, non-professional firewalls and switches. And just by simply putting in a professional commercial grade switch and programming it effectively can prevent a lot of issues. And it can, it can move you along the road to compliance, All right? The other thing is, is change passwords. So admin one, manager, manager, whatever it happens to be, right? Change it to a unique, difficult password. Now, it doesn't have to be a randomly generated 16-digit uh, uh, password, but what I've seen a lot is is just a, a, a phrase, right? Head and so shoulders, knees and toes, exclamation point, right? All one word. Right, things like that that are, are usable, but put uh, uh, but change your passwords. Assign a unique ID to each person in the system so that you can go back and you can easily easily control access to your systems, and you have the tra the audit trail to know that this person person took this action, and when we need to change that. It's easy to change because we're changing it on a per person or a per group basis. This person's in that group, All right? So just assign a unique ID to each person, All right? And then regularly test security systems and processes, All right? Go in, don't set it and forget it. Don't set it and come back five years from now, uh, uh, but routinely make it part of your, uh, your process to do that. So that's, uh, that's what we have for you uh, today. I think we're gonna open it for questions, Sue. Great, thank you. Um, just a reminder, if you have not submitted your question yet, you can still do so using the question box that's on the left side of your screen. Or actually, it might be on the right side of your screen. Um, all right, guys, here we go. First question. Does 2W Tech do penetration tests or audits? Uh, we do. Uh, we do both. Uh, but the first thing we do is we do uh, the audit, um, and uh, uh, or as we refer to it as a gap analysis. So, uh, and we have, we have various tools to do that. We've got some, uh, uh, some systems that do an analysis of your network, depending upon if you need to be PCI compliant or NIST compliant or a combination of both. Um, we are uh, uh, currently working towards uh, GDPR. Uh, so that's not available yet, uh, but we're expecting to see a whole lot of thought of um, uh, areas uh, or a whole lot of uh, movement in that area here, especially as it it kind of connects more traction to people trying to figure out whether it applies to them or not. Okay. Next question: Does the Microsoft Azure deployment with Active Directory assist with some of the issues or common deficiencies you guys were referring to in your presentation? Tom, I'm going to give that to you. Sure. Um, there's a couple of ways that it does. So the, the short answer would be yes, there, it does assist. Uh, two, two primary ways. One is that you're uh, now forcing yourself into an environment that's more um, tightly designed. So, you know, the first, you know, physical, physical access to the equipment is now, you know, that's being handled on a, you know, on a good basis. Um, the firewalls are world class. The network infrastructure is world class. Things like that. You know, Microsoft is handling those pieces. So that's uh, uh, one aspect of it. The other is that the process of getting yourself migrated into there. Uh, you know, you're going to pay on a you know per user per month base basis for users. So it's a really good time to go look and make sure you don't have any expired user accounts in your Active Directory. Um, you're going to so there, there's the process of getting your your things your data cleaned up, brought up to date, up to the latest standards, so that we can hook you into Azure Active Directory. Uh, that makes a big difference as well. So yeah, it does help for sure. I would say too, just to just to add on to that too, is is Microsoft is constantly on top of the new 
threats and the new methodologies. And so a lot of that will be baked in just as an automatic part of your subscription to Azure 365. Yeah. Okay, uh, next question. How often do I need to be addressing maintenance areas in my network? I, you know, I think it depends on what compliance, what what agency compliant your your compliance you're trying to, to to fill. But typically, we recommend quarterly. The fact of the matter is, unless you have a lot of changes to your network all the time, once you go through the initial 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 gap analysis and remediation of those gaps, you're 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 in and it's in place. And you, you typically don't have to spend a whole lot of time with it on a day-to-day -day basis, but I certainly think you have a. Um, uh, I, I I I I think that you could um, uh, easily just once a quarter take a look. Uh, certainly, you probably have to submit something once a year for your compliance piece, for sure. Okay, how do I know where to begin with getting compliance? I'm sorry, say that one more time, Sue. Yep. How do I know where to begin with getting compliance? Boy, that's a that's a that's a ten thousand dollar question, right? Um I would say I think what you need to do is you need to you need to do the gap analysis, right? So somebody's come to you, they sent you a spreadsheet, they said, Hey, you need to be ITAR compliant. Uh your PC your credit card uh uh vendor has said Hey, we're going to do a PCI audit on you, and you want to make sure that you know you 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 have it together on that. Um, you need to find out where you're not compliant, and so you need to do an audit against all those different things. On the NIST, uh, the NIST thing, Tom, how many how many NIST uh, line items are there? Compliances, 150 or something? Yeah, I'm thinking in the neighborhood of yeah, 175 to 200. Yeah, so you have to you would want to go through each and every one of those and say, "Yeah, I I got it. No, I don't got it." And then figure out what you got to do to get yourself into the 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 got it category. Um it's it, it it can be a lot of work. Um that's one of the advantages that we've been able to bring to the table is that we have the ability to. We've done it a lot, so and we have the the kind of the the infrastructure to to facilitate some of that stuff uh to get you to that point in a in a fairly quick manner. Okay, um, next I, question. I'm, Mark, I'm, go ahead. actually on that last one, Sue, I'd also just like to add that, uh, you know, in, in many cases you might be subject to several different regulations or agencies. Uh, there is a lot of overlap. Uh, we started off talking about that too, but I just want to draw back under that. You know, the IT general controls that go with Sarbanes-Oxley, the NIST controls, ITAR, you know, there's 80 plus percent that's an overlap. So, you know, I wouldn't let the daunting nature of it stop you from getting started. Okay, and I actually think this next question kind of fits in with what you guys were just talking about with that last answer. Um, something like this could take a lot of internal resources and time. What advice do you have for a small business to tackle this? Uh, I, you know, I, I might be biased in this, uh, in this response, but, uh, I outsource it, right. Um, uh, get somebody in who knows what they're doing, who knows how, how to, how to, how to do that initial analysis. Um, uh, get the initial analysis done. Then once you get that back and you find out where you're deficient, uh, then you can start making some decisions on whether or not you want to try to tackle that internally or if you want to, uh, uh, you want to outsource that uh, that stuff as well. I think Tom, you, anything to add to that? No, no. I mean, just yeah, just don't don't not start. That's never going to be the right answer here. <laughs> okay, we just have a couple more. Um, we do have a follow up question, Mark, to the one um, that was asked about um, if two W does tests and audits, and the follow up question was about costs associated with that. So I don't know if you want to answer that for the masses or if that's one we want to follow up with afterwards. It really depends on what we're trying to accomplish. So there, typically there's a, uh, there's a fee for the initial gap analysis. Uh, it's not a huge demonstrable cost. 
and then after that, it depends on what we need to do, right? What do we got to do to get you um, compliant? Again, how much work do you want us to do? Uh, how much work do you want to do yourself? Um, so it's really, it's kind of on a case by case basis. PCI, for example, is a more, uh, not intrusive, but in-depth analysis than say the NIST analysis, uh, just because of the inherent nature of the, uh, of the information. So it really kind of depends on what we're, we're trying to uh, get to, but it, uh, uh, it's certainly, uh, in the big scheme of things, it, it the cost of it is far 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 less than any penalties or uh, uh, loss business that you may incur by uh, by doing that. So if you want to know, I mean, just there's my email or my phone. Just give me a call or drop me an email, and we can talk about your specific situation. Okay, it looks like I think we have one more question here, unless more come in while you're answering this one. Um, how do I know that I am balancing access with security appropriately? Uh, Tom, you want to take a shot at that? Sure. Um, and that's going to be another one that's very, you know, it's certainly going to be case specific. But you know, at the end of the day, there is, um, well, you know, in, in, the, in the world of best practices, we talk about uh, just enough access just in time. So, you know, you want to make sure that people have got access to what they need to have access to in a way that's lined up with what your company's goals are. So, um, you know, if you don't want the guys in engineering to be accessing payroll or if there's a regulatory reason not to, then let's make sure that they don't. Um, but if you've got somebody with that wears multiple hats and you need to, well, let's figure out how to do that in a way that's managed and responsible. So that's where I would start is making sure you've got just enough access when you need it. Um, the beyond that though, it's, you know, also looking at, you know, what's the environment that I'm in. So what's the regulatory environment that I'm in? Again, if you're a defense contractor or you're handling credit card data or you're handling, handling patient information, there's some really hard rules. Um, if you're a sub subcontractor of defense, you know, way down the tree, you might have a little bit more flexibility in there, but even those are really starting to get you know, mandated. So, you know, there are some hard rules you got to make sure that you're following. And then from there, it's how do we balance, um, which I realize might be restating the question even, but how do we balance, um, you know, following the rules with making sure people have what they need? And that's going to be a, you know, a pretty case by case thing, but we haven't yet found an instance where we couldn't do it anyway. Okay. Well, Thanks, guys. I think that's all the questions that we had. Thanks, Sue. If Thanks, we, everybody. Yeah, if we can get anybody any follow-up information, or if you have any more questions, you can reach out to Mark. Um, his contact information should still be up on the screen. Uh, we'll do the best we can to help you out. Um, thanks, everybody, so much for joining us, and have a great day. Thanks, everyone.